Hi, well I'm Steve Duffy, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm Clinical Director of Adult General Inpatient Services in Canterbury here, and I've been involved with uh, suicide prevention in the Canterbury area. I've worked in community psychiatry as well as inpatient, I've sort of been around the traps. Uh, and I was fortunate enough uh, a few years ago to go to Detroit and visit um, the Henry Ford health care system uh, uh, and meet um, Ed Coffey and his son and look at the perfect care program they had running there. And then I went on to the IIMHL meeting in Oxford uh, with Keith Horton. And uh, we, uh, we, we, with IIMHL is an international initiative for mental health leadership. And that was a fantastic meeting. Uh, with people from all over the world involved in suicide prevention and, and, and also the sort of genesis of pulling together a sort of international group around zero suicide out of the United States Initiative. And, and you, have, you have to say that that was very much um, driven by David Covington uh, from RI in, in the States. Uh, and he still remains a tremendous leader in that field. So anyway, my little bit to talk about from all that really exciting international stuff, um, our little bit, what we're doing in Canterbury, and I must say that Joe's given a, a, an overview, a very expansive approach, and, and I'll, maybe it's helpful if I just take a small approach uh, to this, uh, where we're starting off and we're sort of looking at growing from. Um, so like, um, uh, like uh, Mersey, we don't have any money for this, uh, and we're pulling together resources, uh, got a little bit of quality staff time and some time for the suicide prevention coordinator and then clinical staff to, to get something going. But Canterbury has signed up to Zero Suicide. So, Stuff New Zealand, um, this would be from the coroner last year commenting that New Zealand suicide rates remain alarmingly high, a total of 579 Kiwis took their own lives in the 2016 financial year. We run on financial years for suicide, which is kind of odd, but we switched to that in mental health just because it lines up with the coronial record. And then this is prior to recent deaths, but the Canterbury region had its highest totals, recorded totals since records in 2007-2008, with 78 deaths, compared to previous highest total of 74 in 2009-2010, <coughs> which is also unfortunately true. So, um, <coughs> but one thing perhaps to comment about suicide deaths in New Zealand, um, and this is a, it's on a busy slide from Stats New Zealand, it goes, goes up to 2013, but we, we had very particularly high numbers back in the late 1990s, the flow on from the, the crash of 87 and then you know, down to, you all know that most of these extra deaths were in males, which is the white blue lines. The females are the, 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 the medium blue lines. And the total deaths, which is in the middle, of course, uh, is, uh, is the dark blue. So in fact, we sort of bounce along. This is age-adjusted rates. So we bounce along at much the same sort of rate and we have been since, since the early 2000s. And that, that, whilst it's changed a little bit, we're still sort of bouncing in the same sort of track nationally. And that's why John Crawshaw, to be fair, uh, was harangued uh, on the media. But he basically was saying, well, actually, the, whilst the total rate's gone up, the population basically has gone up. And the age-adjusted rate, which is the sort of effective rate per person, per 100,000 people, so to speak, hasn't changed very much, which, which is true, but they're still, they're still quite high. It sits in the middle of sort of OECD countries. So we, nonetheless, <laughs> it is high and we want to reduce it. So we just had a look here at um, coronial reports and service deaths through to 2017, so that's the financial year just finished in June. And just looking at deaths in Canterbury, so this is how it's gone, 73, 60, 68, 61, 78. And then we also include a statistic for our services. So just look at types of care. So we had 14, 15, 12, 15, 13. Um, and most, all the, almost all those deaths occur in outpatients. Um, and every now and then we have some inpatient deaths. So um, that hasn't changed very much over those years. Okay. It's probably starting to get worse in Canterbury. We had a bit of a spate. It's always hard to know, but the numbers bounce up and down. So we haven't, so those deaths in the community have been reflected here, <coughs> and you'd have to say that the stats for the numbers going up and down are not necessarily statistically significant. I, do, I doubt that there's a significant increase at this point from these numbers. They're still just bouncing. Which is one of the problems with <coughs> suicide prevention initiatives is that the numbers go up and down a lot. It takes quite a long time, especially if you get down to numbers <coughs> under care, 
in a particular DHB, you'll find it's quite hard actually if you, if you achieve something dramatic like 20% reduction in suicides, it might take you five years to actually recognise that statistically. Anyway, uh, so there are a lot of difficulties in, in showing the effect of these things. So the Zero Suicide Initiative, uh, as Joe said, it's a zero suicide deaths for individuals under care within healthcare and behavioural systems, which is what Americans call mental health services, are preventable. And uh, it's a bold goal and aspirational challenge, which is a, another way of saying it's a BHAG. And it doesn't say in this particular quote, but it's a really a quality initiative. It's not, it's, a, it's an initiative the whole service about quality of care delivered. So, well, this is <laughs> my next slide. So it starts with leadership and organisational goals. And I think Joe's really well described that uh, in the Mersey Care thing. I, I don't think I, this, this, this particular talk really doesn't focus so much on that. We developed strategies for preventing suicide within a specific organisation with a wide variety of implementations and the sharing experiences and results. And so in the last couple of years we've, it took us a year or two to work up for some projects and in the last couple of years we've been putting them in. So we'll tell you about that. So we've done so I did an analysis, this is going back a little bit of time before we started this thing, just some more data from the coroner's office, pretty kind of 216 suicide deaths in Canterbury. Hey Steve, <laughs> you go a bit louder? Okay, sure. 216 suicide deaths in Canterbury through June 2012. I was analysing the data in 2013, I think, so you have to go back a year. The Canterbury rate then was running round about the national rate, and 37 of those deaths were under specialist mental health service care. And 100 of the 213 have had contact, so that 63 extras had, 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 had been seen by our services at some time and discharged. Okay? And we just, this is just a little bit of background really just to illustrate uh, how mental health services need to approach. So still in service we had 37, up to a week post discharge we had 8, and a month post discharge was another 3, and then out to a year is 24, which is where you go to, wasn't it? Mm. So you have 24 plus 3, so basically double your numbers if you go out to a year. Uh, a greater than a year was an, another 28, and that was the total. Okay. And it, we just looked at quickly, just worth knowing the temporal relationship to contact with services. So again, we had no one who died by suicide whilst awaiting assessment, but up to a week after first contact, or in the service or discharge, the numbers just slowly climb. So a lot of people are dying more than a year out from services, or, or still in the services. They're, They've been in, this group of people have been in services more than a year. But almost half our, you know, not quite half our deaths were people in long term serious mental illness care. And discharge in the services, the numbers sort of climb as well. But again, half or so had more than a year after contact with services, which we'd saw before. Okay, so our initiative is based on the perfect care from Henry Ford, it has three con components structured acute care, live quality feedback, and a research protocol. Not all of this is in place yet, but I can describe it some of it. So structured acute care, so we have a structured triage response tool. This is uh, for calls or people initially presenting just to figure out where they're at. Uh, and that covers a wide variety of presentations including suicidal ideation or risk. We have a model of care for crisis resolution, I'll some, some more information on some of these later. Supporting documentation for patients and family, training for staff and risk assessment and talk and treatments training, which is motivational interview we've used. We've actually just introduced a semi-structured risk tool and structured risk assessment and protocols for response to levels of risk. So, um, so this is focused on our crisis resolution service or an emergency service, as you might say. And <coughs> this work here basically was done, a lot of the work was done with a number of groups which included sort of staff, including our registrars, nurses, frontline staff workers. We had family representatives and patient representatives on the groups and they, they worked up each of these uh, with you know sort of support and expert input. So this is, I don't want to get too much focus on this but we have a, a risk allocation tool beyond the triage tool just for suicide and it's really it's really structured to say whether someone is at sort of extreme risk and we have their eyes on, sort of agitated people who are distressed and want to go out and harm themselves through to what we call high, intermediate and low risk and basically, we did this to capture a number, of, a pattern we saw in our service where staff would do a risk assessment and then rate the risk as sort of low or medium. And then they'd call a registrar in to see them and then they'd be admitted to hospital or something. So what we had was staff who were sort of responding appropriately to the problems the patient presented, but they didn't want to record, high, they got high risk 
phobia uh, because they sort of felt that that would be a bad thing and they'd be responsible if something happened. And so we sort of forced them. So if someone's made a suicide attempt, you know, some recent serious suicide attempt, then they're, you know, extreme risk until they sort of considered otherwise a suicide attempt. The general suicide attempt would just put them in a high risk category. And then there's a sort of a bit of a protocol for their initial management about contact with a registrar or consultant, about <coughs> always having contact with family and whanau, about completion of a safety plan, provision of the information pack, and discussion of removal of means of suicide, and then a home visit for the short period of time before people say of high risk. So that's just an initial management plan. Everything else is driven from the clinical team after that sort of point. It doesn't have the drivers from this. So we, we basically, the other concept we had in this was we defined the sort of high risk groups and then we described, described the low risk group. So if you don't have anything going on basically, or very little going on, then you're low risk and everything else gets intermediate. And if you're in intermediate, you get most of those things but not so much urgency. So we wanted to make sure that people who are at, at a sort of a, a modest risk of suicide still got an information pack, still had some contact with their family, still had some discussion. It wasn't so urgent but that, that occurred and preferably before they, it occurs before they leave the department. So it was about trying to cover the basis really uh, and get some basic stuff and then having the, you know, more, and staff can bump people up these risks. It's a very crude table. It's just designed to capture some basic stuff. Okay. So I'll just talk, look, maybe not about that, but just go back to say, while this was all happening, we put our staff through training and risk assessment, which we derived it uses, what's his name, Pis Pisani, is it? There are five modules with the static and dynamic factors. And um, so it's structured around that. It's our own training over a couple of days. It's structured around that. We get to do refreshes every couple of years for the staff. And we're probably going to introduce the risk management tool from the same, the same model from, which has been developed since, uh, since we started our training. And the, we've decided on motivational interviewing largely because it's relatively straightforward for people to pick up. It's, it's good to apply to pretty much anything. So any sort of area of your practice, motivational interviewing techniques are useful. If you use it, it re reduces DNA rates, it increases adherence you know, to AOD programs. It's just, it's just everywhere you go, it's useful to have that as a basic practice. So we want to introduce some more comprehensive, uh, maybe CBT style work later on, but we, we just this is, it was the first tranche. Okay, uh, so then um, we've, we're looking at a, a live feedback app, which um, basically there's lots of types of apps for all different sorts of things. So just to say what we're, what we're looking at is we're looking at one which gives feedback around appointments with staff, face-to-face -face appointments, okay? And I don't know if people know of the Scott Miller tool. Any hands up, anyone knows of Scott Miller's? Yeah, okay, so my outcomes tool. So we're basically going to try and use that one or something similar. Um, and we think, particularly in crisis resolution, it'll be useful. Um, and we're still figuring out how, how it will work in uh, enduring sort of, you know, longer term care and perhaps in patients. But um, we, we have an update for our core uh, electronic medical record, which allows us to create um, apps which are part of that record and it can go on devices like mobile phones or tablets <coughs> or anything or computers and it gets sucked back to our record. There's no, there's no um, shadow left on the device. So it's secure and, and uh, private. Uh, and so we're basically hoping to get this going next year. That's our job. Um, so that basically every appointment people will start the appointment. I don't know if we use the, if we use the Scott Miller one. They start the appointment with sort of a progress report. How, how well are you doing? fairly basic like it scale type thing and at the end of the appointment basically there's a few questions on uh, how, do you, how do you feel this appointment has met your needs that you've come along here with and we'll probably add a safety question in as well and then if, those, if there are problems at that end point type interview of the report then you go into the remediation process and figure out what you're going to do about it. So that's, that's we, we think that that's going to be a tool largely to increase engagement and alignment between uh, consumers and staff, and a, a build of quality. There's quite a bit of evidence in community counselling level that that's quite effective. It's going to be more interesting to see how that's applied sort of deeper into specialist mental health services. I think our crisis resolution services <coughs> run with a group of people who probably follow the algorithms that sit behind that tool. 
know, tell you whether people are responding in the right way, but I'm not sure that our enduring care or wards necessarily would follow the same algorithms, and we might have to develop our own to see how we're going. Okay. So we're also working on research protocols with University of Otago. We've got some other people starting up this group, um, and we're <coughs> collecting data from SAP, which is our information system, the live feedback tool, emergency department, and other CDHB records. And we can look a bit further, uh, looking for associations with suicide and more importantly, serious suicide attempts. So, you know, we, we, we think that it's going to be difficult to see progress in terms of <coughs> um, suicides because, death by suicide, because the numbers are relatively low under care. We're talking about sort of between 10 and 15 a year. Um, but if we target suicide attempts, then we've got sort of roughly 10 times as many attempts. Uh, serious attempts that present to ED as people who die by suicide. And so that should be a lot more responsive to data analysis. So I think I've got some tables here which are really just pulled off our system. They don't represent what we're looking at at the moment, but they help you understand. So this is called Signals from Noise, is the name of the program that pulls this out. And these are emergency department attendances with deliberate self poison. Um, and it goes back to June 2011 here, it runs through. So Signals from noise sort of does some things that you probably aren't so relevant for us. One is it, it tries to plot out demand curves. And it's a very good program if you've got things like influenza epidemics. CDHB use it to decide when to open up extra wards on the general medical side because they plot plot out the influenza epidemic progress and, and then they, they, you know, so you can plot out demand. Obviously we're not really wanting that to do that. But it, the other thing is it's got a sort of a run chart in it and it tells you when you've left the, the, the pred predicted 95 percentiles of demand. Yeah, so this one, rather interestingly, it's sort of good because it's got some interest in it. After the earthquake, we had a big drop in suicide attempts in Canterbury. So we were running along about 50 people per month presenting with deliberate self-harm by way of poisoning requiring medical attention. And we, it dropped down to like 25 for a while, half, the rate's half, and then they climbed back up again. And then we had a big bump a year later. Uh, and then it's sort of gone back to roughly where it was before. So it just shows you that um, changes in suicidal behaviour in the population are much better represented by these sort of numbers than they are by our suicide rates, which doesn't show this type of variation. So it's, it's, it's quite handy to have that sort of data as well. And we've also got the same sort of data for uh, people uh, wounding themselves or cutting. The, the numbers are much lower, that's 10 sort of average through there. So that's going to be much more reactive. As you can see, it bounces up and down a lot more. And even though it's doing that, it's not reaching significance because it's, it's got a bit more variation and because the numbers are small. But it also had a dip back in 2009, uh, which is probably after the first earthquake, I imagine. But not after the second one. Sorry, so, Stan, can you speak up a little bit? Oh, sorry, sorry. So, the, so these are, these are self-harm by... Uh, by cutting, by wounds, and um, the numbers have responded a little bit to some of the earthquake stuff, but they've generally just tracked along much the same. So those are the two data sets we can easily pull out of the emergency department, and we can look at the statistical significance of any changes there, in addition to obviously death by suicide. And, but this is much more live, of course. You, know, you don't have to wait for a colonial hearing. So beyond these fairly straightforward clinical processes, which I've sort of described and how we're looking at it, and we will be going bigger, but we're just sort of getting through a few tasks. Um, what, what to do more from our perspective in terms of um, uh, suicide prevention? So I've, I've put up sort of three things here for people to talk about, and I'm being fairly specific, I guess, rather than big picture-ish. So the first, first thing I think we need to do more of, and we need an organised approach, we need some sort of central coordination of resources, governance and research. I mean, we've only got four and a half million people in the population. You know, the smallest DHB has got 35,000 people under its care. You know, it's, it's to imagine that every DHB is going to come up with some sort of thing that's going to need to be diff that much different and that important is a bit silly. And we need sort of targeted areas of effort and some sort of funding algorithm which helps us disperse money when we think we can gain some success. So if we demonstrate that we can do something well, then we want some way of prom you know, promoting that. And I guess I like to talk about how we do our roads in New Zealand for safety. So when the Roading Commission puts in a road, they're looking at traffic rates and truck weights and economic benefits and 
you know, how wide the road needs to be and how much they can spend on the corners. Uh, but they also have a funding algorithm for safety. So things like those terrible cheese grater things they put in along the sides of the roads with wire and things to stop cars leaving and slice motorcyclists in half, um, they, they get, can't come in on a funding algorithm. And they basically say that a person's life is worth $2.5 million to save. And they'll spend up to $2.5 million to do things they think are worthwhile on a road. And I think we should think about valuing people's uh, lives or death by suicide in a similar sort of way, that we actually say, well, actually, we can do something here. Does it cost so much? Is it worth doing? And that also happens with Pharmac, with medications. So they will do an algorithm where they look at lives or quality of life years or life safe through a medication being released, like statins and stuff. I'll come to that. And, and that also, you know, have they have an algorithm when they decide, look, we're going to fund that because it will save more lives. The next thing I think we need to do is really, one thing we miss out is destigmatising and engaging suicide attempt survivors. I mean, the missing group is, that's often so clear from meetings I go to is that we have professionals and we have family members who are bereaved by suicide and we don't hear specifically from people who uh, have survived suicide attempts. And actually they're a very important group in this equation. And actually I, I must say that when I went to the American Suicide Association, Association of Suicidology uh, meeting in Phoenix. They were, you know, they were, they were basically the three groups well represented throughout the meeting. And they brought a, a sensibleness and richness and, and cogence uh, to the meeting that um, the other groups don't necessarily hold. Uh, they're very, they're, they're quite realistic and they, I think the conversation's greatly improved by having them along. And I would say that it seems to me in New Zealand, uh, observing it, is that, you know, when someone dies by suicide, we have a big outpouring of grief. People say, you know, that's a terrible thing, it is a terrible thing that's happened, they've said, and you know, that, that was a life lost, and, 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 and we value that person enormously. But if the person survives an attempt at suicide, just shut up, <laughs> sit over there somewhere and try not to say anything about that, <laughs> you know? We're not so valuing <laughs> of that life, which actually is safe, you know? So, so that, and that's 10 times as many people. I mean, it's a big chunk of the population, probably close to 10% of the population made a serious suicide attempt. I think probably 8% if you actually get into the numbers. I mean, they're, they're, they're huge. They also contribute about 40% of ultimate deaths by suicide. So it's a group of people who can be fairly easily identified. They're in the emergency department record. We know who they are, and they have this risk that goes on a long time, and it's a good group to think about if you're thinking about suicide prevention. When I say that, most of my colleagues say, oh, but the other 60% haven't. That's no good for a risk assessment. <laughs> anyway. And the last thing is uh, targeted psychotherapy from the mental health space. And in New Zealand, uh, we're, we're much worse than you are in the UK at delivering psychotherapy for people who need it. Uh, and this is an area which you know, really could benefit. So what have I done? I'll just expand on my discussion on slides here. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to one side. Problem numbers. Yeah, so 40% of the population experience suicidal ideation. So if you, if you go to the telephone survey, to, I don't know, they get about 20%. They phone people up every five years and say, last five years, or last period of time, have you had thought of killing yourself? And about, ultimately about 20% of people say yes. But the Christchurch Develop, Development Study, which went through to about age 35 when I last heard from them, who asked people every two years, <laughs> what's going on for them and have they had suicide ideation and, and they had seeing with the person face to face. You, you, the numbers accumulate and they get to about 35% by age 30 or 35. Remember. You, you'll be sure by the time people get to the end of life they've got another 5%, so I've said 40%. So, you know, it's not uncommon. Most of, you know, not most, nearly half the people in this room um, will have laid awake at night on some terrible day of their lives and thought, oh, this is too horrible, you know, I just, just I should just go jump off a bridge or something. And then they'll have convinced themselves not to go jump off a bridge, which is good. But, you know, we're not, we've all been there. 10% you know? make a serious attempt and 1% die. So, about 25% of those are dying by suicide under mental health care, so we've got 75% outside of mental health care to worry about. But half of those dying by suicide have seen mental health service, so opportunities exist. And, but the other problem is even populations that you identify at a high risk. You know, they, they, they only bear about a 2% mortality in the year that follows. If you send them in the emergency department, so this is a high risk person, the chances they'll be dead in a year, they're not 98% chance they'll be alive. So 
these are sort of dilemmas that we have, that we have to sort of face up to. So one of the ways that we deal with that is just trying to get everybody some basic information about suicide awareness, networking, prevention, give their families some information, how to keep them safe. Okay. But I'll go on to one study, and it hasn't been repeated, and it probably never will be. It was in the Lancet in 2015. It's a longitudinal study of psychotherapy for post-deliberate self-harm <laughs> suicide attempt. So this is something you, you can study in New Zealand because we don't do it. <laughs> um, and it's quite a big, it's a big, one of those big population studies where they, uh, the population of Denmark, and they established suicide, um, oops, what's that all about? <laughs> is that me? Yeah. So I just talk about it anyway because I don't need a slide at the moment. It would be good to have it back sometime. Um, they established these uh, psychotherapy centres for people post deliberate self harm or suicide attempt, and they sort of rolled them out as much as they could. They were quite popular, I believe. Uh, and, but nonetheless, quite you know, large parts of the population didn't get seen by these centres because either they hadn't been rolled out to their city or they're in rural areas and stuff. So they, they have these big population <coughs> uh, databases. And basically, what they did, they, had a twi they followed things back 20 years after the establishment of these study, these uh, therapy centres. And they looked at populations who'd made a serious suicide attempt and gone to an emergency department and been seen, and then treatment as usual, whatever they got, versus people who went to these centres. And then they also did a data analysis where they matched, so out of like five to one uh, who did or didn't get it, then they matched about two to one. They did the age and gender and race and stuff. And, Stuff like that. Well, it would be good to have the slides though. Yeah, I think they've got a technical issue. Uh, <laughs> it is a technology centre, so. Yep. <laughs> uh, and yeah, what they found was, was you know, quite compelling. It's, it's li not likely to be repeated, you know. No, 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 one's, no, one's, no one's got to roll out a bunch of highly expensive psychotherapy centres in their country who doesn't have it at all uh, and suddenly, uh, you know, be able to do a study like this and you have to wait another 25 years to do it. So. We've probably got this as our main thing. So, they looked at death by suicide. One year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. And if I, if I just go for the odds ratio, so odds ratio means if the odds ratio is one, nothing's changed. If the odds ratio goes up above one, things are worse for suicide, that is, obviously. If they're less than one, they're good. And you're down here, basically if you go to 20 years, you're at 0.75, which means 25% of the population are not dead by suicide who would otherwise be. And because of the population they were studying was not whole, they thought they'd saved about 30 lives at that point. Okay. But this is really interesting. <laughs> they also were able to study death by any cause. And so the odds ratio of death by any cause dropped to 0.69. That's a greater drop than the drop in odds ratio of suicide. And they saved 153 lives, if assuming that the psychotherapy was the source of the benefit at 20 years. But they're saving lives all along. So this is the thing where you're treating for one thing, but you actually get other benefits. Three times as many people appear to survive for general health reasons as for suicide. If you wonder about what that's about, I, th I thought it might be smoking cessation. Anyway, could be other things. So this is where they drew out the cohorts by age group. So 10 to 24. 10 years seems young, but anyway, 10 to 24. 25 to 49, so this is WHO youth, 25 to 49 and over 50. And the benefits were greatest for the young people, okay? But they had less deliberate self-harm, but they halved the rate of death by suicide that time. So if you're treating someone under 25 you're re with this therapy, you're reducing the rate of later suicide by 50%, okay? And then basically that fell off as you got older. Middle-aged people might get in there, no, I don't. But um, they, their reduction is about the same as the average for the thing, 25 to the Older people, like over 50, not that old, but uh, was only a 10% reduction. So the benefits were greater the younger you were. But the study was for the same length of time for all people. Okay. So just to say, and this is sort of back of the hand calculation, but I've pulled the data from the National Database. Statins in New Zealand, they were introduced, they have enough, this is number needed to treat. Number needed to treat it? I lost that slide. The number needed to treat to save a life, and this is about 37. I think I'll put it down. Yep. 
Statins have no believed to save a life is 30, so you have to give 30 people statins for, I think, five years and spend $85,000 on all the other people as well to save one life. And we think that's worthwhile. Pharma thought well, that's a good deal. Statins are in, <laughs> in a big way. If you know what statins are, they're the cholesterol lowering drugs for heart disease and stroke. ACE inhibitors, that's a blood pressure one, which also strokes and heart attacks. 26, only cost half as much, 47 for a five year period to prevent one death. So if we go to psychotherapy, and just look at the whole population of that, number needed to 37, with $55,000 to prevent one death by suicide or other cause, so all cause mortality over a 10 year period. So, and as I'm saying about the funding algorithm and economics, you, you, you can, this is worth doing. You know, just in an ordinary way, if you regard it as a drug, you would say, oh yeah, that'd be worth doing. And I think that's it. Yeah, that's my last slide. So, thank you very much. <laughs>